Well, Rama Jamma, Yella Hamma, it's time for another edition of the Bama Slamma. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and click that bell so that you don't miss a single video that we post. If you'd like to support the show financially, please go to patreon.com slash smackdrawpodcast where you can see our monthly subscription tiers. You can also get cool stuff there like sticker packs and t-shirts. We'll give you a free shout out on our shows and you can get even more than that. If you just want to make a one-time donation, please visit paypal.me slash smackdrawpod. All the proceeds from our Patreon and our PayPal go towards making our brand and our every show we put out much better for you, the listener and the viewer. Don't also forget, please, to follow us on Twitch. We stream live on twitch.tv slash putting you over. We also switch uh, stream on our personal Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash smackdrawpodcast. And finally, wherever you listen to podcasts, go find our sm- our podcast, Smackdraw Podcast, subscribe to it, and, may- and please leave a comment. We thank you so much for your feedback and your support to making this show what it is. Again, guys, welcome to the Bammer Slammer. I'm your host, Bam and Dave, and I'm joined by a very esteemed panel this morning. First off, he is the host of the Botched and Chair Shots podcast. He's a chef by trade, but he's a mark by choice. He is the chef, Will Gray. Will, good morning, sir. Good morning, man. Thanks for having me on this morning. Uh, I'm excited to have you on, man. So let me ask you this. Since I'm going to call you the chef from now on, what's your least favorite thing to cook? My least favorite dish on the planet is anything that has to do with green peas. Despise green peas. Yeah. See, I'm not anti-green peas. It, it depends on how, <laughs> like you said, it depends on how well they're cooked. If, if they're too fresh, I don't like them. They got to have some kind of seasoning with them. For sure. I just, I just can't yeah. do the green pea thing. Least favorite uh, ingredient on the planet, for sure. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I can't wait to hear more about that. Also joining <laughs> us this morning, uh, he is the newest member of the Get You Podcast. They cover wrestling, MMA, and so much more. He's the man. He's not mad, but he's Charlie B. Bad. Charlie, good morning. How are you, sir? <laughs> I love the intro. And guys, make, <laughs> make sure you guys do donate. I, I hear it's it's lucky to donate at least $100. So just make sure. Get on that Patreon and donate to, to the podcast. So <laughs> at least 100 And then, by the way, I love green peas. Really? Do you really? <laughs> no, no. Like, well, actually, you know, I'll go back. I'll, I'll, I'll take that back. I was recently in London, and I had mushy peas. Like, dude, So, like, like, I don't know if you ever had that before. It's actually very yeah. good. It's like, so, you know what? We're already disagreeing on stuff, so hopefully that's the last time. There we go. I'm liking it. (laughs) I'm liking it. Guys, again, welcome to the show. We're going to have some fun this morning. We're going to talk wrestling. But before we do that, uh, those of you that are watching this are going to notice that their Twitter handles are all different colors. Uh, What I love to do, keeping a little bit with the sports and competition feel of the show, is I love to do our favorite sports team's colors. So, of course, me being Alabama Crimson Tide, we're all tied. It's the crimson and the white. Will, would you please like to say who your colors are representing? The Tennessee Titans, we're all about tighten up, so represent that rolling into 2021. Okay, I got to ask you, Will. I'm a Titans fan, too. The Falcons are my primary team, but the Titans are my number two. So if they ever meet the Super Bowl, I'm going to lose my mind. But (laughs) since that season with Kurt Warner and getting robbed at the goal line, what has happened to the Titans? Uh, We've had an up and down, the series of events since that happening. And I've always said, I recently said on Twitter, in an unpopular opinion, we weren't a yard and a half from winning the Super Bowl. Yes. We were a yard and a half from tying the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I'm a diehard Titans fan, and I say that every day. We were close to tying. Right. And since then, it's the same thing that happened with the UT Volunteers. We can't solidify a coach. We can't solidify an offense. So it's this constant roller coaster up and down. So I feel like having Tannehill in the mix, having Derrick Henry ready, having – I mean, I'll represent it. Then your boy Julio Jones just came on board. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's huge. And then uh, A.J. Brown from Ole Miss. I mean, he shows out every week. So, I mean, we finally have a solidified offense. We've got Mike Vrabel, you know, and then, like, looking forward through it all, I feel like this might be our chance. We're in that so – they call it that open window where you yeah. have a little bit of time to win a championship, and I feel like that's us within the next one to three years. And if we don't get it done, then it's not going to happen. 100%. 100%. The Falcons are the same way. You think they're going to go all the way, and then they meet the Patriots in the Super Bowl, and they get shellacked. So (laughs) it's just what happens. Charty, who do your colors represent? They represent the Chicago Bulls. But uh, you know what? The funny thing is, like, if my second favorite team is I'm representing them today. It's the Tottenham Hotspur uh, soccer. I I was trying to suck up to Chris D's. But then, you know, the man can make it today. But even so, like, <laughs> the, the Bulls, 
Oh man, I'm not I'm not feeling the Bulls as much as you're feeling the Titans, but I don't know. I was gonna make a joke too, saying that you know what they've only got they're gonna fall down to Tannehill, but then <laughs> <laughs> but then right when you said that they got Julio Jones, I'm like, all right, never mind, because <laughs> like with Julio, AJ, Derrick Henry, man, you guys are looking good. Yeah. Or while while Atlanta, I don't know, they might be the Kyle Pitts. Yeah, <laughs> Atlanta never. Atlanta will have. A good season, a couple of years in a row, and then coach change or personnel change or yep. whatever. It just always sets them back. The only team you you know is going to be consistent is like the Patriots because, yeah, good oh, yeah. grief. Uh, I mean, Bilicek is just – he's the Nick Saban of the NFL. They're always going to be good. You just know they 100%. are. 100%. Uh, okay, well, Charlie, going off of so- you, I have to ask you this. I know you probably are sick of answering this question, but being a Bulls fan, I'm sure you hear it every day. What's that? Both in their prime. Who's the goat, Michael or LeBron? <laughs> That's a great question. the The true answer is the White Mamba, of uh, Brian Scalabrini. <laughs> <laughs> That's but the I've one. Been, like, okay, well, well, I, I've heard this. Like, I mean, I've been asked this a million times. I'm still gonna say Jordan. It's because like no one's just no one's a bigger competitor than Michael Jordan. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, the guy was a killer. You put put the ball in his hands when it was clutch. He and then like. Six six finals, six championships. I yeah. mean, I like, and who who knows if like if he didn't take that two year hiatus, it could have been eight championships in eight years. Could have been, but it could have, should have. You never know. I mean, don't get me wrong, LeBron is great, and there's a reason why it's a debate. But I'm sorry, I still got to roll with Jordan. Will, do you agree? One hundred percent, a Jordan guy. But I also yeah. grew up watching it in the '90s, so I mean, right. seeing the Bulls go on that dominant right. run, like yeah. he's kind of always been the staple. But I get why the generation that le- that early 2000s and beyond group, I see why they're saying LeBron because they never had yeah. a chance to see Jordan. You know, the same reason Agreed. that guys, but the guys before us are saying that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell will never be passed. Right. You know, it's always that's about the generational. Thing. Absolutely. Yep. And it applies to wrestling too. I'm sure some, I'm sure some of that's going to come up this morning as well. Guys, to kick off the morning, I want to do a fun icebreaker thing, something that I love to call a uh, match of the week. So real quick, guys, I want you to think back in your mind real quick. We're gonna start with Money in the Bank because that was the. Actually, you know what? Let's go back to let's go back to even Slam Anniversary and let's start there and let's work our way towards last night, which was Friday Night SmackDown. And let's go. What was your guys' match of the week? I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you uh, from my perspective first. And uh, I my match of the week was no question Roman and Edge. Roman and Edge at Money in the Bank was such an emotional roller coaster. I, I'm big on character, and I'm big on storytelling. And Roman and Edge told a beautiful story, which perfectly tied up uh, you know, Roman and the Usos and the Mysterios. It also set up uh, Edge versus um, uh, Seth Rollins down the road, and it brought John Cena into the picture. So that entire 25 to 30 minute window was just so emotional for me. I enjoyed every single second of it. Roman and Edge is my match of the week. Will, what's your match of the week? Um, I, I hate to piggyback off of you, but you're absolutely right. Re- Edge and Roman have the, the the pick for me solely because the storytelling that, that told they had everything. When I talk about a match, I talk about like in baseball, they've got a five tool player. In wrestling, you've got things that you have to watch for. Mm-hmm. They sold a to- they they sold a story. They let each other get over, which is so crucial in today's yes. wrestling. They allowed each other to 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 do each other's moves. They let each other kind of. All of their packages were shown. They had a chance to get over with the crowd. And with it being the first pay-per-view back, all of that. But I think what made that match was solely the the finish and then Cena coming out. The reintroduction Mm. to John Cena is what made that match. Because we built up. We saw it. We knew the hills were going to go dirty because they weren't going to change the strap this quickly. Roman's building up to the SummerSlam trade. We all kind of saw that coming in the writing. We kind of see it leading up to SummerSlam. We didn't know who the big comeback was going to be. Right. But like the solidification in the last five minutes of that match is what made, in my opinion, made the whole pay-per-view. Because up until then, it wasn't great. It was just okay. You know, like right. some of the matches were kind of up and down. And then we get to the end and then the main event just rocked it, just blew it out of the world. Mm-hmm. So, Charlie? Yeah. You know what? Like you said, like storytelling – like you, I love, love, love storytelling, and I love, you know, just just the whole build up to everything, right? And I'm gonna go completely against it because, like, I don't, okay. know, like, <laughs> which is like, because like uh, the the point of like wrestling of Al Corsal is to be like really entertained, right? Right. And that men's Money in the Bank match 
was just blew my freaking mind. It was great. It was, it was, it was great. great. I mean, like, I, I love Edge and Roman, but, like, at the, after the uh, men's money in the bank match, I was like, oh, man, nothing could top that. Because, like, that match started, like, like it started on fire. Like, you know, like, people mm-hmm. are just go- going at it. And I love that whole little, little mini story. of well, how, like, how did it start? Because Peacock kept screwing up for me. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be a lights-out match, you know? It was like, like, it was like here, if, if anyone's watching right now, it was like this. It was like... <laughs> exactly. That's, that's, that's the beginning. Of Actually, the it was more like. Yep. That, that, eh. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. But no, it was it was like the whole story of Drew versus Big E. They kept teasing it. Yeah. Like Drew versus, and then like all the wrestlers kept coming in, and Drew and Big E just like established damage by just tossing guys left and right. Right. So like you know they so they they got the crowd going right away, and it like it kind of eased off a little bit, like especially after like what's his name, uh, Drew got uh got uh kicked out of the match supposedly by by um. Mahal and the boys, mm-hmm. but then after that, I think it was right after the Ricochet's amazing flip, like where where Riddle tosses him off the off the uh, ladder, yes, flips off, you know, and he flips onto the guys, and then then the match just picked up. Yeah, after that, it was just like ooh, bam, pow, like crazy moments. Like you got yeah. you got. I think it was uh, Owens getting thrown power bomb over the top rope through a ladder, and it was and of course the ending too. Like just like how you guys said mm-hmm. the Roman and Edge match, that ending just like. Was like the cream of the crop. Same so thing good. with, same same thing with the Big E ending. It was just like, yes. uh, like the Big E hits the Big E, or was, I think that was called the Big Ending for the top ending. rope. Yeah. Yep. And then climbs up, and then it was anticlimactic. But at the same time, you just felt it. You know, the yeah. crowd just wanted it so bad. When he grabs that briefcase, it's just like, oh. So that that was for me the match of the match of the night. Oh, and match of the week. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, I'll I'll give a runner up to uh, Chris Jericho and uh, Sean Spears. Uh, that that they that match was much better than it should have been. And, but it, it goes to prove how great Chris Jericho is, and Sean Spears is is so un- criminally underrated. I love Sean Spears as an as a performer. But uh, and I also give this just my, one of my personal little awards. The shocker match of the week for me: Charlotte Flair, Rhea Ripley. I gave, surprisingly good, right? I gave that match zero chance to be good because because the storyline has been butchered so badly. They they just ruined both characters. Charlotte should be her dad right now. She should be the arrogant, don't have much to say, just gonna run my mouth queen, and they made her a drama queen and everything else. Rhea should be the bad A she was in NXT, the nightmare that hung toe to toe with Shayna Baszler, gave us great matches with Charlotte with Io Shirai, and she hasn't been that. But when Charlotte threw up that finger and said, I don't care what y'all think we're fixing to put on a banger, I was like, okay, there we go, there we go. And you could tell even Rhea's face changed. Like, okay, block them out. Let's just do what we got to do. So it was surprisingly good. So I agree with you guys completely on all these matches. Now let's go, who had the best moment on the stick this week? Let's go promo of the week. What promo did you guys hear that hits you in the gut and you're like, okay, it's going to be a hard thing for me to forget this promo. Will, this time I want to start with you. Okay, uh, I'm going to go with a, a left, like a curveball right here. You guys might not, I don't know the the situation with your monitoring. I'm going to go with uh, the hot mess Chelsea Green's recur- return okay. to impact. When okay. she came out, she cut it. She came out, had a great match, you know, and then Slammiversary, she had the mixed tag team match. And uh, when she was on the, she just came out, she just rocked it. And I felt like she had a lot of like gumption built up from the way she got cut from WWE. Mm -hmm. So I give her like the pride award for being able to come out and just kick it and just show what she had to do. And then like, and and like I said, kind of a left field thing, because when she came out and then the mixed tag match, and then they just dominated it, you kind of forgot because she had been the 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 interview queen for WWE for so long that when yeah. she got in the match she can still do work for like not just for a female wrestler but for a wrestler in general the 100%. girls got talent you know 100% yeah. All right I'll go next uh my promo of the week not in the same vein but on the same show Jay White on Impact Thursday night Yeah my gosh I guys I'll, I'll just point this plot out I don't watch Impact Almost ever. I catch highlights when I can. It just comes on at a wrong, at a bad time for me. But I happened to be home this time, so I got to see it. And when he made his appearance at Slammiversary, I said, okay, now we're going to finally see if New Japan wants to play and, and really get involved in this story. And when he came out and, and said, 
I don't know what club you boys belong to, but it ain't the Bullet Club. I was like, okay, okay, now let's do this. Yes. Now let's do this. And that's why I threw up that question yesterday. If you could pick four Bullet Club members, who would you put with your with your Bullet Club? And I went on record to say, I want Hangman Adam Page. I want Adam Cole. I want Finn Balor. And I want um, uh, Tamatonga. That's my Bullet Club. If I had those four... You got speed, you got, you got the guys that can easily form a tag team, and you got a powerhouse that can get the work done when he needs to get the work done. So uh, that's my bullet club. Charty, promo yeah. of the week? Promo of the week is, I got to go with the same with you, dude, Jay White. When I when Jay White came out, and he like, well, he went after Carl Anderson. Oh, my goodness. Yes. He went after Carl Anderson. His ass said, you peaked when you, were, when you were in the finals of G1 that year. Yep. And... You, you, the good brothers, are not good enough to be in my era of Bullet mm-hmm. Club. And he said that, uh, I forgot what else he was, he was saying that uh, you, you guys are everything, like I am what everything that you guys want to be. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, he is killing these fools. And so I, w- I was going to go with that too. But I want to give a special mention because like, like on Twitter, everyone's loving this one. It was uh, Roman Reigns. Yes. Because of that missionary line. Mm. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Can't believe they let like, him go there. Yeah, exactly. It's like it's like oh, John Cena, same thing. It's like missionary. I'm like I'm just sitting there like there ain't nothing wrong with missionary. But the point is like nah. like that was, you, can that was get, pretty, you can get a lot of that work done there. You know, that's like, what I'm saying. <laughs> that's like, like, you, you got control, baby. But anyway, like I digress. Uh, but uh, to go to go with your Chelsea Green uh, promo, I wanted to add up on that too. I love those promos when you get someone who's just angry and you just yeah. give them you give them yeah. you give them like an an outlet like it, it like i i'm thinking of, of like S- uh, steve austin when he first joined ecw mm-hmm. or or like another one where it was like x-pac when he when he showed up in raw yeah. talking about talking about how like like eric Bischoff would be so far up your ass he'll know what you have for breakfast you know you just remember those one liners it's because that anger that fire you know so like i got built, like that chelsea green one was fire too it was a terrible idea from Bad Creative, and it's gone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when people get mad, they say what they say the truth. They absolutely say the truth. All right, She's guys. She's worth money. She's worth that Chelsea Green. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 when she showed up at Ring of Honor, I was like, okay, this is yeah, a little yeah. bit. But then I was like, come on, Matt. She's coming to play with you. You know she is. <laughs> this is not even going to yeah. be a not even going to be a question. I agree. Awesome, guys. Awesome. Okay, let me uh, clear that. All right, now before we get into the meat of today and the fun of today, I want to do one more quick thing with you guys, and that's called underrated or overrated. So I'm going to name you guys five topics, five topics, and I want you guys to tell me, based on that topic, underrated or overrated. And it doesn't matter who goes first. Y'all can just jump in and start talking. First topic, Kenny Omega's belt collector reign these past six months, underrated or overrated? I'm going to go overrated right now. And it's simply because he really hasn't, I don't want to say he hasn't done much because I applaud the man for the belts that he does hold, but he goes between impact and AEW. He's not really going anywhere else with the door being open the way it has been. He could go into Mexico. He could go into Japan. He could have the opportunity, you know, ultimate or Ultimo dragon style where he could go to multiple like promotions and Tony Khan is giving him. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's giving him the ability to do so and he's just not taking full advantage of it. So I get it, but at the same time, he's really not putting forth, you know, everything he could get out of it had he actually did the work and put in the work. Charlie? Charlie, I think I stole your answer from the looks of your face. 100%. But it's okay. It's okay. Like, I don't know. It'll be it'll be uh, underrated when he finally has all the championships. Like, sort of like, you ever seen that Triple H meme where he's got, like, belt on his thighs and he's got a belt, like, on his, like, like biceps, like, everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, no, uh, he, he's a uh, great mind to think like. So, Will, I think you have a great mind. I'm saying, I'm sorry. But, but, uh, but like, an- another thing I wanted to say was that, you know what? Having a title in any promotion is great, you know? So, like, that visual of holding the, the, that many titles is always going to be good no matter what. So, yeah. if, I, if I wasn't going to say overrated, I would have said just right. If, if You know, it's kind of the cop-out answer. Mm-hmm. But, it's, it's you know, he, he is getting the praise that he deserves because it's like having multiple titles anywhere looks good. So, yeah, good on him. I'm going to say overrated as well for the simple reason of, I, and I don't care if I piss people off when I say this, Kenny Omega is overrated. I, 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 I do not... I don't like him. I, I don't think he is as great as everybody thinks he is. Is he athletic? Yes. Can he do stuff with his athleticism? Yes. But is he a great register seller, and can he put other guys over well? No. 
No. Kenny Omega will take a package pile driver on the ramp and get up in 30 seconds. Tell me how that's <laughs> really believable. This stuff, that, that's the kind of stuff that irritates me. And AEW has a bad habit of that, but Kenny Omega has always done that. Even in the matches he had with Okada, as great as they were, if you go back and really study them, every time Okada would hit him with something that should finish a match, he was up within a minute. That stuff does not compute to me. So I, I think it's I think it's definitely overrated. What I will say about Kenny Omega that is underrated is his ability to make me hate him. That is undeniable. I cannot wait for everybody who steps up to him to take one of those belts off him because he is that good at making me hate him. So props, Kenny, for that. On that era, <laughs> you are underrated. All right, guys, next topic. Bianca Belair's 100-day reign as the SmackDown Women's Champion. She just crossed 100 days this week. Underrated or overrated? Uh, I'm going to say overrated. Okay. Like, just, be- just because, like... I mean, maybe it's just me not paying attention, but I don't really know who she's beaten. You know, like like since she's won, because mm-hmm. like she beat Sasha, but other than that, it's like what, what has she taken out Carmella twice or something? Yeah, or, Carmella twice. And then like Carmella, like I mean, she's talented, she's great, but then they haven't booked her as like a as a world beater. You know what I mean? So it's like, and I'm trying to think. I can't think. Remember off the top of my head who else she's beaten? Bailey so, twice. Uh, Damn. That, okay, there goes my argument then. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, so, okay. No, let, let me take that back. <laughs> Bailey once, and then Bailey got hurt. So just Bailey once. Okay. Yeah. So so yeah. even then, like even like just the fact that I didn't remember it, that's why it's gonna be easy for me to say overrated, just because of that. I mean, Bailey's great and all, but you beating three people. That's like two of them are Camilla. I'm gonna like. Ooh. <laughs> that's all I gotta say. That's that's my answer. Ooh. If Bailey had had that I quit match with her, would you think your answer would be different? Hundred percent, hundred percent. It's but but she didn't. So yeah, it's what have you done for me lately? Yeah, Will, do you agree? Uh, I'm gonna go with. Uh, I'm just kind of setting on a fence post. I feel like her reign is exactly where it needs to be right now, with it being her first big title reign. I feel like they're building it up. She's had a couple easy title defenses where we knew they weren't gonna change the belt yet. I think the Bailey feud would have been great had she not gotten injured. So I feel like it's kind of exactly where it needs to be right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say probably overrated in the sense that they're trying to, I don't want to say push her too hard, but she already has the belt guys. Like (laughs) let her win on her own. You know what I mean? Like let her show us why she's the champion so early. Let her defend the belt against quality opponents, but still write good booking. So she still gets over and her opponent does as well. So I feel like it's just kind of right where it needs to be right now. Because to have a 100-day reign on your first reign, that's still saying something in its own regard. So I feel like we'll see where it goes the last half of the year when she actually starts putting the belt on the line in pay-per-views and mid-match situations. Okay, good. I'm actually going to say exactly what Will said. She's right where she needs to be. Uh, I, I think if she had had that I Quit match with Bailey, we would be singing her praises a little bit more. Yep. I hate that Bailey got hurt. Well wishes to you, Bailey. You've done your A plus work this last year and a half. I hope you get better. Come back. And I put this on Twitter two weeks ago. When Bailey comes back at the end of this injury, I want her to get a Triple H MSG pop because she deserves it. Mm. When she comes Absolutely. out that when she comes out that ramp, I want the whole room to jump to their feet screaming because Bailey has shown she is an MVP that needs to be pushed to the moon when she comes back. That year whenever that is, the Royal Rumble next year, pencil her in. Just go ahead and let her have it because she's that good. I I I, I completely wholeheartedly agree. Um next one. Per- perfect timing back to get off of what we were just talking about. Jay White as the leader of the Bullet Club. Underrated overrated i'm gonna jump on this one right off the rip and i'm gonna say underrated because if you put him against the other guys that have ran the club going back with prince devitt uh i'm a huge finn balor fan so i'm gonna go ahead and say it's not him i think the the initial branding of the club needed a little bit more push from uh, new japan than aj styles one of those good but not great situations and, and he had Kenny a good Omega. brother yeah, and then Kenny Omega. So now coming into JY, I would say of all the talent next to AJ Styles, I think JY is the most talented in ring worker of the four leaders of the Bullet Club. Mm. So, like, that's a big statement right there because Ooh. I think Kenny Omega is great. AJ Styles is phenomenal, you know, playing on no the plug. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, like he's, a, he's a great worker in the ring. The dude's great on the mic. He's great in the ring. He can work. Same thing with Finn Balor. And Finn Balor. I'll say he's he's up there on my list right now for modern wrestlers. But I feel like Jay White as a whole is 
maybe the best in ring worker that the club has had as far as leaders go. all around. So all around, worker. yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlie, what do you think? I like. I hate to be boring, but I agree. I, I agree a hundred percent. Like once again, I'm I'm trying. Are you like, sure? I'm, because in the beginning, you kind of disagreed. I did, but then like the way he put it, I was like, oh my god, it was so eloquent. It was so nice. <laughs> 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 and, like, and like the point, the like because like for the sake of argument, I wanted to say something else, but I was like, damn, he's right there. Damn, he's right there too. Because like, okay, well, I, I mean, I disagreed to the where where like the whole. Um, I think I still think AJ is better, but it's because mm. of his body of work, because mm. of the, the time he's put in. You know, it's like I think I still think AJ is better, and that's where I that's where my disagreements stop. Yeah, you know? yeah. Because like, like who, because like who knows how where Jay White would be with the same amount of time? Because like you right. know, like AJ was was headlining Ring of Honor in two thousand two. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's that's what's with that like eighteen years. Yeah. You know, yeah. but but see, I didn't really, I wasn't into Jay White up until that match where I thought was a masterpiece. I think it was him against. Uh, against Ibushi, like where it was like those storytelling and it's fine. It's where, where he was, he let himself be vulnerable, even though he was like the, the man of bull club, but he was just like in the middle of the match. just like, I, what can I do? I've got nothing. I can't beat this guy. You know, you don't see that with, from heel, like, you know, and like, it's, but besides that, it's like, it just opened my eyes. Like, Oh my God, this guy's freaking brilliant. Yeah. And like, and like, I am like, you know, I am the biggest Jay White simp out. Well, not the biggest, but you know what I mean? Like I am huge, huge Jay White fan. So, I gotta say underrated. This is tough for me, guys, because yeah. I don't. I have not really fully watched New Japan. I again, like Impact, just basically oh. highlights. I did go on YouTube one time and I watched a documentary on the Bullet Club. So that got me because um, there was a time about a year and a half ago. I'm like, what the crap is the big deal with this group? They look like an mm-hmm. NWO ripoff to me. So I was like, what is the what That's is exactly what they are? Exactly. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, what's the big deal with this? But then I went back and watched. It, like, okay. There's a lot of similarities, the two sweet, the colors, but other than that, these guys are cutthroat. These guys are different. And so I was like, okay, I, that, let me get a better look at this. I think I agree with you guys all around uh, leader is Jay White. But if you said, David, who's your personal favorite? Prince Devitt. Mm. Because he, yeah. em, he embodied that, you cross me, you're done. He embodied yep. that, you know. It was a little, and only only Jay White since then has kind of taken on that cutthroat mantle, aka Switchblade. So <laughs> it's it's kind of been a little bit of that. I think AJ Styles had a bad disadvantage going in, and that he was too loved. He he, ever, he was so already over the moon, already you know, over uh, everybody loved him from TNA and from Ring of Honor and and everything. So by the time he got to New Japan and. And and took that mantle. I was like, "How am I supposed to hate you? You know, how am I, yeah. how, how am I supposed to you know take you seriously as a, as this evil guy that's going to stab me in the back? I just don't see that." And um, but uh, and y'all know how I feel about Kenny Omega. So I, I, I just I think that I agree with you guys. I think Finn Balor and Prince Devitt are neck and neck for me. Uh, but I think uh, excuse me, uh, Finn Balor and Jay White are neck and neck for me. But when it's all said and done, I think Jay White's going to be pretty untouchable. I think he's doing a plus work right now. Uh, with the with the talent he has around him. All right, two more, and this is going to segue us perfectly into our our main discussion for the day. Drew McIntyre's WWE Championship runs during the COVID era, underrated, overrated. Uh you want to go first, Charlie? I don't think he heard it. Oh, yeah, I can't. We can't hear you, Mike, Charlie. Uh, there we second. go. There we go. Okay, Are we good? I, I, I'll start. the 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 um the question was Drew McIntyre's WWE Championship runs during the COVID era underrated or overrated? I, I'm gonna say this with conviction: supremely underrated. Supremely underrated. I know a lot of people have Drew fatigue. I get it. I get it. He he was he was around the you know around the championship as long as he was. He he basically held it for a year. But there's a reason when all this stuff hit the fan. There's a reason they said it's got to be Drew. We've got to we've got to follow through with the plan. Brock can't retain it. We got to put it on Drew. He, the character, the maturity, the finisher, the story, everything about him was good enough to say to the fans, "The hard times we're going through. I've been through those hard times. Stick with me. We're gonna get through this." Just like I got through the 19-year career I've been through, we're going to get through this era. Ride with me. And um, thankfully, I will say this. It would have been overrated if not for Randy Orton. Randy Orton 
was the perfect Joker to Batman for him in that time. Perfect story. Loved it. They, they did some magic there. I know why they gave Randy Orton that one-month reign, because they're trying to slowly, subtly get him up closer to that number 16 uh, for a potential story down the road. So, uh, But I'm going to go underrated. I love Drew McIntyre. I do think towards the end of the COVID era, uh, they got a little bit too aggressive keeping him in the Lashley picture. I think they could have done one or two months off of that. But as far as a total perspective as a whole, if you look at the current WWE roster, who would you put the belt on during that era? Drew McIntyre's top of my list. Absolutely. Charity, what do you think? I think you're right. Once again, oh man, I really want to disagree. I'm trying my best to like. It's to, okay if there's anybody yeah, that's no, a close second for you. Say that too. Uh, well, well, I just want to like add on to your point where it's like, yeah, like, like it speaks volumes when you don't have a crowd and you're gonna put the title on him because, like, once you like, like you said, let's you know keep let's keep the W afloat and who who else are you gonna go to? Like, shoot, like. I was, I'm trying to think of someone funny to say, but there's like I can't even make a joke out of it. It's like Drew McIntyre was the guy, and they also made me really want to see Drew McIntyre win it in front of a crowd. You know, and that's that's the best part. Like you know, like they like how they took it off him. Now you just want more, and that's how I know it's underrated. Because in my heart, it's like I just got to see it. I just mm-hmm. got to see it happen again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's so. And then once again, I like to I like to build my my arguments with like you know like people he's beaten, but in the end, it's like that aura that he's built. You know, where it's like he's still like when he comes to the ring, puts a sword in there and the crowd's going nuts. And like, you know, the whole like the the background, the fire and everything, it's like you feel that he deserves it. Yeah. You know, so it's like in the end, I think he's very, very underrated, not just a little bit, but really, really underrated. So agreed. Will. OK, I'm going to throw a, a wrench in the spokes, boys. Go ahead. Overrated. OK, overrated. Ooh. Okay, so here's my standpoint for it, all right? Drew, as a worker, is phenomenal. He's a great guy. I think in the ring, if you put him with the crowd, he's the perfect guy to hold the strap. I think during the COVID era, it was just misbooked. I feel like during that time, they could have had an opportunity to put the belt on somebody who was young and up and coming when they weren't too worried about ratings or selling tickets or any of this. You know, like at this point in the booking style, it's not about putting butts in the seat. So it doesn't matter if the guy's a realistic champion or not, it gives some of these guys a chance to get back in the title scene that worked your AJ styles, your Randy Orton's. Cause I completely agree that they're building Orton up to have a chance at it. I just feel like it's overrated simply because of it being misbooked. It's the, the Paul Heyman at uh, what was it? Uh, the ECW one night stand 2006. Mm. He looked at JBL and he said, you were the only champion. You were only champion for a year because Triple H didn't want to work on Tuesdays. Right. Drew McIntyre was champion for a year because nobody else wanted to work during the COVID era. Mm. And I'm going to say, wow. that, okay, know, okay, like, wow. I'm going to okay. put it out there. Like I'm going to call it what it is. He's a he's a great worker. The dude does work. He, you know, if you look at him from when he first came out to his three man band days to where he is now. He's developed so much. And when he left WWE the first time, he came back a totally different worker. Now I feel like he's built for the crowd. So I feel like for the last year, he was kind of a placeholder champion. He was the only big dude that looked like a champion that was real willing to work. And I hate to say that about him, but that's what it boils down to. It was him and Randy, you know, and that was it. The guys, when you think about what a champion looks like, it was those two and that was it. So I feel like his reign during the COVID era is overrated simply because it was misbooked. If he was the champion now, he would be killing it. But okay. because of when he was champion, it just it wasn't I feel like it was just up and down for him. It could have been done better and it could have given other guys opportunity. But dude, after that moment at the rumble with Brock, they had to. They had yeah. to. Mm-hmm. You you gotta you gotta put that off for a whole year and, and, and keep Brock as champion until WrestleMania thirty eight. You can't do that. No, I'm not necessarily (laughs) saying we keep Brock. What I'm saying is you get him over, you let him lose to Randy, and then the title goes through this, like, tumultuous, like, bounce around. Not necessarily to where it, like, takes away the relevance of the title, but have Randy hold it, then maybe have somebody like AJ hold it, and then have Drew come back around at the end towards WrestleMania again and give him the real WrestleMania shot. He I deserves. see what you're saying. Okay. You see what I mean? I like, see. It was misbooked in the sense. So that you're not I angry. Like, you're not angry at the first six months. You're angry at the back half. Yeah. Bingo. Okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like okay. he, he should have gotten it at Mania, but I feel like they lost an opportunity to book for younger guys that could have had a chance to 
to get that that prestige back to it because I feel like AJ's lost a lot of his gumption. I feel mm. like Randy did for a long time. Some of these big name guys, and we all know that right now with the way they're cutting people, like you never know who's going to go next. You know what I yeah. mean? So like it lost a lot of opportunity for them to write some of these other guys up into the right up into the system versus just letting Drew set on the belt for a year. So I think it was more of a booking thing than a Drew thing. Gotcha. All right, finally. And we'll continue our discussion on this with this one. The Thunderdome for the COVID era. Overrated, underrated. Honestly, look back over all of it. Give me your gut check. I kind of just, I I can't say anything other than just right. I don't know why. Because it's like, like, what else can you do? You know what I mean? They they, They made, you know, it's like, it was pretty cool. Like, like it was a really cool thing to see, like all the fans in there. And then for me, like I, I got into being the Thunder a few times, so I was like sitting there watching myself, like, ah, like you know, but <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean. So, so I, I don't know, cause it's like I'm trying to think of what else they could have done. I mean, yeah, the booking could have been a little better too, but in the end, it's like you know, their incentive wasn't like you said, put butts in the seats. You know, it's like the incentive was just, just let's just do it, deal with what we got. Let's g- generate some revenue. Let's get some, you know, let's get some eyes on the product. And then like, you know, it, visually you just see like all, like all those screens, it just looked pretty cool. And so like mm-hmm. in the end, I can't underrate or overrate it because it is what it is. You know, you're in a, an industry where it's like predicated on like having fans there. Cause like yeah. a lot of good matches are like, the crowd reaction makes the makes makes the match sometimes. You know, the yeah, crowd interaction 100%. makes the matches sometimes. So it's like, so I mean, I might have just argued myself to saying underrated because these guys were working with like pure silence. You know, unless they could hear at least like the fake crowd noise too, which in the end you still know it's fake crowd noise. Some guys hitting a button. Yeah, let's go Goldberg. You know, it's like you know what I mean. It's like no one push that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so I mean, it could I could even argue that it's underrated because yeah. you're. you're you're, work, you're doing empty studio wrestling and you still got like a big, big like atmosphere of like lights and everything like that too. So yeah, it's yeah. either underrated or just right. I'm going to go underrated completely. WWE went into this already with attacks all around. Well, how, how come How come they're competing at all? Pull them off. Remember that whole argument for the first part of the COVID yeah. era? Don't, I don't even want to yeah. see them on TV. Give them a break. Give them a vacation. Let's figure this out. And Vince McMahon said, "No, just like 9/11, which when tragedy strikes, we're going to be there. You're not. We're never going to not be on television for you guys. We have to be there." And Triple H said the same thing on his interview with Corey Graves that there was never a question: Are we going to stop doing this? No, we're not going to stop doing this. So, but then, okay, AEW goes outside, and uh, and WWE says, "Well, we're just going to improve the CWC, and we're going to improve the Thunderdome." So, a little bit of me was like, "Why can't we go outside? Why can't we do?" A thousand people spread out over an open field or something. Why can't we do, you know, a live reaction? But I get it. Any the WWE is at a place right now where anything they do is going to be demonized. Anything they do, anything they try to do, there's no way to get past it. Just the, we're, we're they're a they're a seventy plus year old company with a seventy six year old owner, and they've been at the top of their game really since 2001. So there's really nothing that they can do that we won't say is bad. Um, it was cool to see you guys like Matthew McConaughey on screen and, and yeah. comedians and, and things like that. To see uh, Ric Flair, to see former legends watching from home, all of that was great. Uh, I saw Mark Henry several times. That was always fun to see Mark Henry. Um, the I agree, the crowd noise got annoying at times because you know that in real life, probably this guy would be getting cheered, this guy would be getting booed. You know, So you just don't really know about that kind of stuff. But for what they had, the hand they were dealt – trying to give us the best they could every single week. I looked forward to SmackDown the same way I look forward to it every week because the booking and the storytelling and the and the and the weekly expectation was still good. Raw was a labor. It's still a labor with fans back. It still is, but so I'm going to go underrated. What else could they have done? And they gave us the best they felt they could give us with what they had. Will? Uh I'm going to have to to, to ride your coattails and say underrated. I feel like they caught a lot, a lot of flack. Like you said, anything the 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 Big E does, they're going to catch all the the turmoil because of how demonized they are. Yeah. It's the situation, the, you mentioned the carrying cross thing. People want him on the main roster. People hate how they used him on the main roster. You know, like 
it's the ultimate like entitled spoiled little kid thing because the the internet wrestling community and the wwe fans as a whole like they scream for what they want and then when vince gives it to them they're like but that's not how we wanted it right you know what i mean so i kind of feel like that's how the thunder dome is it's underrated in the sense that it gave us wrestling it gave us an ability for fans to be present even in the the led capacity that it mm -hmm. was but it still wasn't good enough you know they yeah. what they gave us was groundbreaking it was revolutionary but it just you know you you built this million dollar platform how come you didn't give us more right. and i feel like that was the general overtone with it the whole time is how come you didn't do more and uh, i agree i thought it was super cool i myself was on there a few times like you said like getting in with you it was confusing the first time waiting for your like your call times and then cycling yeah. through but i feel like overall underrated i feel like for what they did with it i feel like they did a good job now let's keep this conversation going with uh with wrestling in the COVID era think about how you guys looked at wrestling before COVID 19 hit in march of last year and where we are today it looks like we're finally coming out of it although a lot of people are still trying to shut some stuff down but Hopefully that doesn't happen. But when you guys look at your fandom, your pure fandom, love to watch it, can't not can't miss any week. How have you guys changed as wrestling fans because of COVID? What do you think? Um, I've went from a wait for it to be live wrestling fan to a DVR fan. I feel like there's a lot of times where I'm not and especially with it being on every night through the week now, Monday, Raw, Tuesday, NXT, blah, 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 going through the whole cycle, Monday through Friday. I feel like that I'm letting my DVR catch it so that way I can simply fast forward through intros. I can fast mm. forward through commercials. You know what I mean? Like I'm just purely looking for the matches at this point because I feel like the story writing and the booking have left a little bit to be desired. I mean, you you all can agree that Raw is complete garbage right now. I mean, just, I'll just call it what it is booking wise. It's, there smackdown is good but not great nxt is doing the best with what they have and i feel like coming out of COVID, it'll give it an opportunity to kind of build up but overall i just kind of feel like they they did with what they had you know like yeah, yeah. <laughs> Charlie, um it made me more of a, more of a fan to be honest like only because it's like it left me wanting more you know because like when you finally see the crowd Oh my God! It's just like you, you. I guess, I guess you, um, you take it for granted. Yeah. You know, like, like when when you have crowds or not. So it's like, oh my God! Like now that the crowds are back, I, I feel like I can't, I can't miss anything. You know, yeah. I got, I got to see this, I got to see that. And not only that, it also helped, like, because the pandemic era, Thunderdome era, was kind of like stale, kind of like wasn't that amazing. It kind of pushed me towards other companies too. So like, like mainly Japan, because Japan did have their their uh their crowds. So like I was watching more Japan, I was watching more like Stardom, more DDT, a lot more New Japan. So it's like in the end, it's like oh my god, I'm a bigger fan than I thought I was, you know. Yeah. So like, it just opened my eyes up to other things. So, so pandemic un unintentionally just built my fandom, if anything. Yeah, I'm gonna 100 agree. It definitely made me more of a fan. And the biggest thing is it made me appreciate the talent. The, the mm. they had these guys did not have to do this. And a lot of them, Sami Zayn in the very beginning said, "Until I know what's going on here, I'm not coming. I'm not coming in. I'm, I'm not. I'm not playing with this." But when I and, and and a lot of people, you know, give Drew McIntyre crap. That's when I really began to say, "Why are y'all hating on this guy? He's willing to do this when he doesn't have to. He's yeah. he's willing to put the company on his back, knowing." He should have had that moment at WrestleMania. It was taken from him, and he still mm -hmm. said, I'm willing to do this because you at home, I love you, thank you for being here with me. What a man. You know, what, what, a, what a, and for him, for Randy, Edge, Edge could have said, hey, no Royal Wumble, keep me out. Not till, not till the pop's there, not till the fans. He said, I don't mm -hmm. care. I'll win the whole thing, and I'll I'll do twenty thousand at WrestleMania instead of the hundred and six I was promised. I don't care. We're gonna do what we have to do because the fans mean that much to me. I, I have so much respect for the talent. I have so much respect for the the guys working backstage, the guys having to go through all of this. But I will say the one thing that it made me appreciate more than anything is the fans. Is seeing that roar around the arena, and I'm saying this right now. NXT, get the heck out of the CWC now. 
Get the <laughs> heck out of there now. Whether it's full sale or you do 5,000 seat arenas like AEW, Triple H, put your job on the line and say, Vince, get me out of here or we're done. Get the heck out of there because you are you are losing so much steam being in there and and NXT is my favorite show of the week. So to go from Raw on Monday night in front of 18,000 to go to NXT in front of 100 with everybody wearing masks on behind plexiglass, <laughs> I, I, this ain't Fight Club. It ain't the same thing. So I'm, just, also, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Like, they, need, they need to get out of there. Like Full Sail made NXT. Like not made NXT, but that crowd definitely adds a, a ton yeah. to NXT. So I'm 100% behind you. I would love to see that, that, that a Full Sail crowd again. Yeah. Every time they go to a takeover, they sell it out. Yeah. Every time, the fans are there. The fans are the fans love them. They're going to be there. I don't know why they don't roll the dice on them. It just doesn't make sense to me. If you look at Takeover Portland right before the pandemic happened, that was a sold out event, and they were looking at the Champa uh, Adam Cole match as being one of the best matches of the year for the it company, was. not just mm-hmm. NXT. Mm-hmm. We're talking the entire in total of WWE. It could have been yeah. one of the best matches of the year at a Takeover event. If yeah. you look at Takeover Brooklyn, you look at. Uh, take over new orleans all of these takeovers they're equally as good as you know you could put them up against any of the the mid-tier pay-per-views throughout the year for wwe you know 100%. what i mean like their takeover events are dominating not the big four but i mean even in the big four you look at the fact that we've had nxt championships at wrestlemania we've had the nxt heavyweight title defended at uh, survivor series so they're getting the recognition they need right. it's just yeah so. All right, last question on on this uh, Thunderdome era. Who is somebody that before the Thunderdome era you didn't give two cents about, and now coming out of the Thunderdome era, they're in your must-see every single week? Any promotion, any way they've been handled, maybe one male, one female. Who, who before the Thunderdome era, didn't care. But because of the work they did in the Thunderdome era, can't miss them. Hmm. This is a bad sign because nobody came to mind when we first said it. You want me to like, start? A, yeah, please. Like, it. Okay, I'll go female first. Bailey. Bailey. Everything that girl touches now is gold. Ding dong, hello. Ranting on Michael Cole. The, her feud with Sasha deserved more. Deserved more. Oh my gosh, it was so well done. So perfectly slow burned. Absolutely beautiful. Like I said... You know, in the beginning of this episode, when Bailey comes back, please, fans, jump to your feet, scream your head off. The girl deserves it. I cannot wait to see her come back. Bailey is absolutely incredible. Um, who has completely taken me by storm, though, and I cannot wait to see him get gold? Hangman Adam Page. Mm. My gosh, guys, this dude is a superstar waiting to finally get that rocket put on his back. And I think it's coming very, very soon. I cannot wait to see him win the championship. Everybody says, why didn't he beat Chris Jericho? Because Chris Jericho is a Hall of Famer. Adam Page is not. That's why. Chris Jericho needed that title to be the first one to be AEW champion. That's been two years ago. We've had John Moxley. We've had Kenny Omega. Adam Page is ready. The fans love him. And we'll get to that in just a minute. There's a little bit more conversation about that. But Hangman Adam Page and Bailey quickly ascended to I have to see these guys every single week on TV. Now, who wants to go next? Um, I'm jumping. Charlie, if you're good with it. Sounds good to me. Um, I'm feeling like, for me, my Theo, uh, my female entertainer is Io Shirai. I feel like good when pick. she won the when she picked the uh, when she won the championship over Charlotte and in your house last summer, I feel like she had an unprecedented title reign. She defended it regularly. She did. She didn't. A lot of the the a lot of the talent through the 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 COVID era, they took a lot of their move sets back. They kind of like because you were shorting your matches. You knew exactly how much you know before the match started. You got seven minutes to work. You've got thirteen minutes to work. Like they knew all of it because it was all so regimented because of the way it was riding. But now, like you look at Io, she never took any of her moves set away. She got mm-hmm. out there. She still did her big moves. She still wanted to get over. And I feel like she is one of those people that never changed. She yeah. never, you never felt a change in the way she worked. But I feel like because of that, she constantly had me waiting uh, for her on uh, NXT. Male wise, I feel like I've got two. 
And it kind of goes with my under or my overrated of him, but Drew McIntyre throughout the COVID era with the yeah. way he carried the title, I might think it's overrated, but at the same time, the way he presented the title was the way the old school territory days presented the title. He was a fighting champion. He would defend it when he had to. Like I, I love the way he presented it given what he had. Yeah. You know, the fact that he was there. So I feel like him. However, I feel about his title reign as a whole. I feel like he was the person that was drawing me to want to watch, mm -hmm. you know, every week during yeah. the COVID era. It was because of the way he presented the title. There wasn't a whole lot of guys that like drew me in, but yeah. he was at least one of them. Yeah. Charlie? Um, I got I got a couple now, like now that you guys are uh, give me some ideas. But the first person that came By the to way, my did my you get shorter, dude? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> get streaking slowly down. <laughs> That's that's the funny thing about Asians. That's what happens to us. <laughs> <laughs> we we age backwards and we lose height. So, <laughs> so anyway, as like so, I just want to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, like um, the first person I, I'm trying to like get back to this one, bad guys. Uh, the first person I thought of was Valter. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. Because, because I didn't know like, who he was answer, till this right? era. Exactly. I didn't even know who he was. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I would like look at like match of the year lists on like on wrestling forums and the people would be like, all right, Dice Case Sakamoto versus Valter. And I'm like, who the hell are both these fools? You know, like, mm. and like, you know, I look at Valter, <laughs> I look at Valter and like you see him, it's like he's got like, he doesn't have that modern wrestling, like, because like, you know, the modern wrestlers these days are like cut, you know, like Johnny Gargano style, his CrossFit, Seth Rollins style. And you look at Valter, he's, he, he just kind of looks. I would never say it's in his face, but you know he looks he looks kind of like pudgy, like but he's tall, huge, and then like but then I saw his match with uh I think it was Ilya Dragunov, uh, uh WWE U, uh, UK or NXT UK, and I can't I can't stop watching matches from now. I'm like I would start going back like watching progress, watching uh, OTT. The guy is amazing. Like he he like even though he's just a big guy and like big man matches, it's not much in psychology, right? Mm -hmm. But for for him, it works. Yeah, it's this whole like get stay away from his hands because it's like getting hit with a frying pan. Yeah, and like ever since then, Valter, I and like I know like uh, upcoming then uh, NXT Takeover, it's gonna be Valter versus Ilya Dragunov Part Two. My God, I had to watch that because yeah. I'm scared for that. Yes. I'm scared for Dragunov. That guy's <laughs> boob might get popped off. Like he's gonna hit him so hard, you know. <laughs> like, and same thing, Valter versus uh, I, he had a recent match against Tom, Tommaso Ciampa. Same thing, like Great match. I, it was an excellent match, and like I can't get enough of him. Mm. So he's yeah. he's my he's one. And number two, I don't know if people agree with me, but like the guys on my podcast will know about this one. I'm simping real hard for two people. One is Maki Ito. Cause like she brings something that you never seen before. Like she's just she's just so weird. But it's like I can't help but watch her. You know what I mean? Like maybe I have like a weird Japanese schoolgirl fetish, but who doesn't? But so like, like, like I don't. So, That's oh, never awesome. mind. <laughs> never mind. So I can't speak for all of us. But but then but like like jokes aside, my the main woman that I can't get enough of is Serena Deeb right now. Yes. She like so they underrated. Call, she's yes. like I think she, like people say she's the best wrestler, a female wrestler in the world, and I agree. Like I'm watching her matches with like with uh another Japanese schoolgirl. I'm forgetting her name right now. Like I uh because they're to me they're kind of interchangeable. I'm sorry, but uh like then then you're watching her matches at NWA. She's got these matches on Impact on AEW, and she kills it every single time. Remember the classic she had with Sheeta? Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Serena Deeb. Oh, I mean, I just heard that Thunder Rosa just got signed to AEW. Yep. I really want. They're gonna time. lock Congrats up. To her. They're gonna yep. lock up. I, I gotta see some some Serena Deeb some more of her and like she right, that's why I'm watching NWA right now because NWA has Deeb they have oh uh, crap it's, it's it's Thunder Rosa or they had mm -hmm. her and then like they had this uh, up and comer Sky Blue they had some good some great wrestlers too but in the end Serena Deeb is the end all be all I love her I gotta see more of her WWE you done messed up <laughs> letting her go too shout out Alistair Black. <laughs> she messed herself up. You don't go drinking in a straight edge storyline. You that's can't true. do that's it. True. That is true. You can't do <laughs> it. <laughs> she messed herself up. That, but no, that's true. Go, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. No, I'll say this. Here's what I want out of Serena Deeb. I want her to get an attitude as a griddle, grizzled veteran that wants more. Give me heel Serena Deeb, babyface Britt Baker. Now. Hey. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Now. Yeah. If, if, 
no offense to Britt Baker and Isla Rose, the match was good, but somebody needs to stretch her and make her work and make her want to win and not just rely on that lockjaw. Serena Deeb will pull that out of her. She Britt will pull Baker that out needs of her. to be a face. She's made to be a baby face. Perfect. This heel, this heel Britt Baker is not what she needs to be. She's not written for it. It works she for doesn't the time. Have, yes, she needs the crowd. If you can't be a heel and everybody in the crowd chanting your name, you know what I mean? Like nobody in the building is booing you. Yeah, DMD. <laughs> nobody is booing you. How yeah. can you be the bad guy? Mm-hmm. Like they need to turn her. I feel like yeah. it has to happen soon. So. It's going to happen organically the way it is. It's going to happen. If you For notice, sure. little by little, she's dropping the attitude and dropping the cockiness. She, she, she's coming there. They're slowly doing it. So yeah, no, yeah. She'll, she'll be face of the company like Becky Lynch in a year. She will be. For sure. She will be. I, I have no doubt in my mind. Okay. Now, guys, we're going to have a little bit of fun. This is a this is a competition between the two of you. This is something that I'm calling... Um, let me get this off the screen, guys. This is something that's called Around the Ring. And I was going to do this uh, uh, earlier with uh, with Chris. Chris had to bail on us, but it's okay, guys. I appreciate him. I know uh, well wishes to him and his wife. They're expecting their second child, so well wishes to them. Nice. But what we're going to do, guys, is I'm going to put scores in front of you guys. I'm going to give you all some topics. Okay. Here's how it's going to work. Each person has 30 seconds to make their case on that topic. Whoever I feel gives me the most persuasive argument gets a point. After all 10 topics are discussed, whoever has the most points will be given the title of the ringmaster. You will That will give you bragging rights. It will give you kudos from me. And I'm going to create a special shout-out graphic ringmaster for you that you can use any way you want on your social media. Nice. <laughs> all right. So that's what it's all about. So I'm gonna. We got the clock. We got the clock here, so you guys can. Um, and I'll, I'll let you know when the clock is. Um, but here we go. So the first topic I want you guys to give me feedback on. Make your case, and I'm gonna start with you, Will. Nikki Cross winning the Money in the Bay briefcase. Right or wrong decision? Nikki okay, Cross winning with- the Money in the Bank briefcase. Was it the right or the wrong? decision 30 seconds starts now okay here's the way i'm gonna look at it from a booking perspective it's the right decision here's why it gives you somebody who's a mid-card performer but has main event status we know she can do it we've seen it in nxt but the way it's going to happen is it's going to be very miz oriented she's going to win the money in the bank she cashed it in she has the title reign it's going to be that short title maybe a month or so reign and then what we're going to see is is a return for becky lynch we're going to see a return for probably Sasha Banks, and it's going to roll into this SummerSlam booking where it's going to be Nikki Cross got her pop. She got everything she wanted. She's the new age uh, Molly Holly, but okay. in the end, it's going to go back. Okay, stop. That's 30 seconds. I gave you five seconds, Grace. Oh, All right. sorry. That's okay. No, I'm going to do that. I'm going to let you complete your sentence, and then I'm going to cut you off. All right, Charlie, 30 seconds, go. I'm going to say right decision, right decision, right decision. This is this is why. WWE finally, they need to get into the, uh, they need to have a direction. Like, you know what? We're going to we're gonna direct towards kids. We're going to direct towards someone. And this is like a, a good, feel-good character that we all can get a, get behind. But in the end, it's like, if you're going to go PG, stick with PG. You're going to, you're going to go, like, go one straight shot. And like, you know, like a lot of us fans, we, we want like sensible booking, right? This one's where it's like, like sensible booking. Let's, let's do the under, the underdog role the underdog story let's do that and the ash it's over a s h whenever the crowd says it okay. whenever you crowd interaction okay All get right. behind it see that 30 seconds goes fast yeah. uh Char- yeah. <laughs> charlie your your direction baby face uh, uh wanting to get kids getting over that 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 was enough that was enough so charlie gets the point on that one Next That's one. Your point with Will. That was pretty good, Will. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> it was tough, but the moment you tough. the moment you said pick a direction and, and go for the kids, I agree. That's yeah. what that's and that's what they're doing. Right. So I agree. Next one. Rumors are that Brian Danielson and or CM Punk may be signing with AEW. If you can only have one of them, who is the better option for AEW right now in their company's history? Charlie, I'm going to start with you this time. CM Punk or Brian Danielson, who does AEW need right now? Go. 
I'm gonna say it's CM Punk because you know why? Because he is the cult of personality. He's he's got it. He's he's gonna kill it on the mic. He's he's shown that with that pipe bomb that he could just make the world explode. People are chanting CM Punk even though he's been leagues gone. They've been dying and and, and plus he's got that uh that outside notoriety. He did he faltered in the UFC, but he was in the UFC. This is a marketing thing. CM Punk. You look at CM Punk. You look at Dan- Brian Danielson. You're looking at Vanilla and you're looking at Neapolitan. I think CM Punk it would be. The man, and plus Chicago, it's, he's a Chicago guy, doing it all out. All right, stop. All right. I was about to say, Chicago guy putting over CM Punk. Not shocked at all. <laughs> Not shocked at all. Shout out Michael Jordan. <laughs> no bias <laughs> whatsoever. Okay, Will, CM Punk or Brian Danielson, who does AEW need right now? Go. Brian Danielson for two big reasons. One, he gives you a grizzled veteran in the locker room to help train and bring up. Yes, he's not as strong on the mic as CM Punk is, but we all can all agree that AEW isn't weak on the mic. They've got a ton of guys who can cut promos. What they need is somebody who can get in there and really teach the fundamentals and the background of what professional wrestling is. And DB is one of those guys. He can teach you from a ground up as a trainer, not just a, a mic worker and a wrestler. Will, you get the point. I completely agree. I, there's nothing, <laughs> nothing. I, I love CM Punk on the mic. If Agreed. I, yeah. if, if I did a top 10 list of people on the stick, he's number two for me. He's that good. I, I will I will not go against that at all. But AEW's biggest flaws are they need to tighten the screws on their in-ring work. They have to. They have to. Long term, eventually the moves won't pop as much as they used to. They need to tell stories. They need to get characters over. They need to get people thinking about the psychology of their matches. A plus, please, Sensei, teach me. Brian Danielson is that guy. He is absolutely that guy. So I would agree wholeheartedly. Daniel Bryan needs to be the direction they go after. Next one. Most fans probably want Big E to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase on Bobby Lashley, move over to Raw, reunite with the New Day, and be the second member of the New Day to be a WWE champion. Make me an argument that Big E should avoid that and cash in on Roman Reigns. So don't don't go after Lashley and reunite with your brothers on Raw. Stay solo, stay on SmackDown, cash in on Roman Reigns. Will, start with you, go. Okay, so here's the situation. We all know that Roman's going to lose the strap early. It's not going to be to Big E, though. Roman Reigns will lose to a Seth Rollins. Roman Reigns will lose to a Cesaro. Roman Reigns will lose to Edge. That's where Big E will cash in and get his title reign. It won't necessarily be over Roman Reigns. It'll be over whoever beats Roman. So that's that's my thing. I think that's the easiest way to a title for him isn't necessarily switching brands. It's waiting for that moment to cash in. So it won't be against Roman. It'll be against somebody who beats Roman. Okay. Charty, Bobby, La- Bobby Lashley, not the right path. Big E should go after Roman. Go. Well, I'm gonna, I, I'm just going to say that I want Big E to stay in SmackDown. This is why I won. It's because... Him splitting with the New Day has been a new day for his career. Ever since he split up with them, he's been like, like you could see him as a as a headliner. You could see him as a main eventer, and like that's why he's got to stay there, like stick to what's good. And the same thing, I would like to even go further and be like, you know what? Let's have an extension of the Hurt business on SmackDown too. If he joins MVP and Bobby Lashley's ruling Raw, then you can make Hurt business even way bigger than it was before. But in the end, I just want to want to keep him where he's at, and and, and do it over Roman Reigns too because you got a face. Toppling a big heel and one of the white hot heel. Oh. No, it's okay. I let you finish. Yeah. I, Charty, when you said it's been a new day for Big E on SmackDown, that sold me. Now, I'm going to follow up real quick. Do you guys agree with yourselves? Do you guys want to see the, the new day come back together with Big E as the centerpiece champion? Honestly, no. Really? I feel like. I feel like if Big E comes back over there, Kofi is the the quintessential leader of the New Day. And I feel like for Big E to come over with a title or to win the title, all that would do is put like the writing of the New Day would have to be completely changed because you automatically would focus on Big E being the leader because he's the the top guy in the business at that Mm -hmm. point. So I feel like if he wins the title and goes back to Raw, then that's going to put that that differentiation between him and Kofi as to who the leader of the New Day is. So I feel like if he goes over there with the title, it's going to it's going to hurt the New Day long term versus if he went over there without it and him and 
uh, Xavier Woods did their thing. And Kofi was the champion again. Interesting. Charlie, you want to add anything or do you agree? Uh, I just want to add that. Well, let's just say that one day uh, Kofi and Biggie are in the same uh, same show and Biggie wins a championship and you see a little dissension within a new day because like you know some of these the best rivalries come from best friends you know like mm-hmm. triple h hbk you know like uh sammy Zayn, kevin owens let's see a little dissension between kofi and Big E. that'd be pretty damn cool and then who look who's in the middle the lovable xavier woods who does he join to does he join to one side the other it writes itself yeah no i i agree i that i i want to see i want to see Big E avenge kofi's beat, uh, beat down at money in the bank i want to see that i i the new day without Big E just feels off. If, like you said, open up a, a carton of Neapolitan ice cream and there's no strawberry in it. That's what the new day feels like when I when I watch them without Big E. They, if, if you're going to continue being the new day and come out to the new day's music, where's your third member? They, they, I feel like they need that back. But I'm going to twist it just a little bit. I think there will be an utmost celebration if he avenges Bobby Lashley. Like maybe say Bobby Lashley gets beaten within an inch of his life by Oldberg at SummerSlam, and then but he still wins, and then that's when Biggie comes out with the two with the two other guys on his flank. Ooh. After a little bit of time, somebody in that group's going to go. You got your push. You got your push. What's going to happen for Woods? And I think Woods could be the linchpin. And when they bring back King of the Ring. King Xavier needs to be what I want to see. Oh, I think that's 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 that the way be, you do that's it. Pretty cool. That's that would be the a new way you do it, career. guys. Yeah. Guys, he's got a master's. No, he's got a doctorate in psychology. He's yep. a brilliant guy. He knows how to get himself over. He knows how to get everybody else over. And he's a great in ring technician. He's extremely underrated, and it's time for him to get his push. So whenever that is, but I I think that story would play out just fine. All right, next one. By the way, Charlie, you get the point for what you said. Um, oh, yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Next one. WWE seems to be backstepping on NXT being their third brand and going back to being that's our developmental show. Make your case on why that's a good thing. That they're not a third brand. They're just our developmental show. Charlie, start with you. Go. I'm going to go to the same thing as I went with uh, Nikki, where it's like just building direction, putting the, making that line, that fine line right there. This is a call up. This is not a lateral movement. You know? So like, that's where they need to draw a line right there. I mean, it's a damn shame that you're going to say developmental is Adam Cole, Tommaso Ciampa. But in the end, that at least now we know what WWE sees in these guys. You know, like, hey, they, we're still saying they're as developmental. Maybe they're not TV ready for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe like, they still need to grow a couple inches. But the point is, I just, like, <laughs> like they're, they're going to put all their eggs in the uh, SmackDown Raw basket. You know, and the, so, like, oh. <laughs> no, I didn't really have a. I didn't really have a good point after that. No, so. no, as I say, that was good. That was good. Will thirty seconds. NXT is just developmental, and that's okay. Go. Okay, so I feel like if you look at it from the OVW days, they had a one-hour TV show every week with OVW. NXT is two hours every week. We've got enough fans that want to see the guys grow, but at the same time, you use it as a chance to get them on TV without a million viewers. And that's what's important is getting these guys used to being on TV and doing work without the stress of being 1.5 staring at their face. Well, I agree. I agree. I agree. They're getting they're they're on USA two hours a week. What are you complaining about? What are you yeah. complaining about? Uh, you're you're getting you're getting seven hundred and fifty thousand average watching on their Nielsen boxes. Who who knows how many millions more are watching on streaming devices or illegal streams? You're getting eyes. <laughs> you're being watched. Stop complaining. You're on TV. People know who you are. And when takeovers are back, you're going to sell them out. Stop complaining. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah. You're fine. That was a great point by Will. So give me give me that point for me, though. But even though his point was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, his, he, he gets the point for that one. Yeah. All right. Next one. This is going to be interesting. The best wrestling promotion outside of AW and WWE is... The best promotion outside of WWE or AEW is Will Go. Okay, I'm going to go uh, New Japan, and here's why. Simply put, they have the most history behind them. They have a lot of draw. They've got the the, the G1 tournament. They've got all of the the big things leading up to the Tokyo Dome. I feel like from the ground up, they're the most developed in-ring promotion outside of the United States. So, and I feel like Impact and Ring of Honor still have some growing to do to be able to compete with that 
Triple A in Mexico is the same way. They're still developing in a lot of ways, but New Japan has the foundation built already. All right. Charty, the best promotion other than WWE or AEW is go. I'm going to say New Japan. Say I, I agree 100%, but here's why. Like New Japan, uh, New Japan World, their subscriber numbers have been skyrocketing. They're, they, and then not only that, they're getting notoriety on AEW. They're getting notoriety on Impact. What other companies are doing that right now? And True. and plus, and I also got to add to like their, their star power because like when you look at like quality of like wrestlers, they still have like killers like Ibushi, Tanahashi, freaking like uh, Naito right now, where it's like they're just they just can't do any wrong. These guys have to like like the wrestling. Pure wrestling quality. If you go on like cage match or anything like that, look at the ratings. Their matches above all have been great. Charlie, you get the point. I, I, I agree. The, the open door, and I, I'm not going back and forth on purpose. Y'all are that neck and neck. It is that good. <laughs> no, I, I agree. The, the When New Japan makes a splash on AEW or Impact, it's undeniable. that There's just yeah. something, there's this aura of reverence and respect about them. I mean, no offense to all the different returns we had at Slammiversary in the previous months, but the moment Jay White's music hit, mm. okay, yeah, so here's here's a star, here's a star. You just felt that, and so I agree. J- New Japan Pro Wrestling, um, you know, is definitely probably top notch outside of AEW and WWE. All right, guys, now here is our um, here is our game changer. This game. Oh, hold on. Yeah, let me let me take this off the screen for just a second. Game changer is worth two points. So this is this and the, so therefore it's definitely gonna be a game changer for this. Here's the game changer. I want you to think of a potential change or adjustment that you would make that would be a huge game changer for a wrestler, for a show, for a promotion, for a tag team, for a faction. So you got a quick second. What's a game changer? that would put a wrestler, tag team, promotion, or TV show on a whole new level, on a whole new trajectory, what's a game changer you can think of? It's hard. That's why it's worth two points. So take five seconds. And Will, your time starts now. Okay, I'm going to go right here, and I'm going to say CM Punk to WWE, and here's why. I feel like to have that, the pop that would come out of that would be ridiculous. The fact that Vince would go against everything Vince stands for and everybody would know it. But you know what that is? That's a pure money grab. You would talk about getting butts in seats and selling tickets. That's the ultimate way to do it. It would be for Vince McMahon to figure out a way to get CM Punk to be on either Raw or SmackDown leading up to a brand change and a superstar shakeup. That right there would be the ultimate way to put you talking about those ratings. That would be it. Charlie, five seconds. Give me a game changer. Go. Oh man, like I'm I'm thinking like AEW, they have so much potential. Like they have the the people, they have like the mic workers, they have the wrestlers, they have the talent. What they need is something like big to freaking happen something huge to happen and like uh, right now i'm gonna put the world i'm gonna put the world title on freaking darby allen and here's why because okay. because wow because like, wow. like, like 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 well the, there you go once again like right away the wow yeah you know, like, like he's a small guy i get it but he's also an enigma and then the, and the way i'm gonna do it i'm gonna have him do it where he turns on sting boom okay wow <laughs> both compelling both compelling mm-hmm. Will, that would shock the world. That would yeah, shock the world. Would, yeah. I, I, I'm serious. Everybody already thinks it's done deal. We're going to see CM Punk go to AEW because he hates Vince. He hates Triple H. He's never going back to the WWE. It's physically impossible. They freaking mm-hmm. fired him on his wedding day. On his wedding yeah. day, oh, they oh, fired oh, oh. him. He's never going back to WWE. You, you come out of Survivor Series or the next time they're in Chicago... And you hear cult of personality, and he walks out on that ramp. Game over. Yeah. Game over. Bingo. Game over. Not, not gonna lie, guys. After he said his, <laughs> I changed mine mid because I was like, "Damn, that's gonna be hard to beat." <laughs> like, 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 I was like, "Yo, that would be amazing." I, I like, I'm just sitting like Darby Allen's a champ. And, <laughs> and with that, Will takes the lead from two up to four. All right, guys. Next one. Hangman Adam Page needs to win the AEW World Championship from Kenny Omega. But where? At Chicago for All Out, which is where he almost won it against Chris Jericho. Maybe at the Arthur Ashe Stadium, where this is going to be the largest attendance in AEW history. Maybe at Full Gear, where Kenny beat him last year. 
Where should I, at Hangman Adam Page win the AW World Championship finally? This time, Charlie, start with you. Go. All right, I would book him to like make it look like he's gonna beat him in Chicago, where it's like he's he just has all the momentum in the world. He looks unbeatable, like and he gets away from Dark Order. But then I want everyone to believe he's gonna win it all out. But I want him to lose it there and then win it in like maybe his hometown because sometimes you just need that hometown feel. You need that away versus home feel, like like the crowd a hundred percent behind him. No fifty fifty booking. No yay boo. Oh, no, I want yay boo. I want yay boo. So I want his hometown or wherever that may be to do it there. So not necessarily Jacksonville or anywhere else, Chicago. I just wanted to word somewhere where it's, the crowds be amazing. Will Hangman Adam Page should win the AW Championship. Where go? Okay, so so here's the booking. What we're going to do is we're going to go to All Out. It's going to be him versus Kenny Omega. Omega, the hill is going to win dirty. We're going to expect him to win dirty. Between there and Arthur Ashe, we have the buildup. We have the culmination. We have the storytelling. You wait, and that's when you put your baby face over, is in the stadium in front of your biggest crowd with arguably your biggest baby face to win your title over your company. Like I feel like it's old school booking from All Out, him losing dirty, to him going over against him in front of the biggest crowd. I feel like the booking and the writing could lead us there. Well, I'm in complete sync. I'm in complete sync. Chicago loves wrestling, but Chicago's going to be a split crowd because they're going to be so mm-hmm. happy to see both people. You got to yeah. you got to get heat on Kenny. You got to steal it. You got to get it out of his hands. You got to make them hate Kenny Omega and then in New York in front of the biggest crowd AEW's ever had, that's where you pull the trigger. That's where you get the roar you're going to get. They're going to be behind him. Charlie, I yeah. almost went with you, but Aaron's Creek, Virginia has no arena. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so when you guys wrestle out there at, a, at that tennis court, you're going to be like, like, that, that pop. <laughs> now, hey, you get it. Now you get him in Baltimore. We got a different story. There you yeah. go. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. yeah. Whole, whole, absolutely. I agree with that. You know, I didn't even know where he was from. So I was like, yeah, I was assuming Texas. Like, let's do it in Austin. But I didn't want to be like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's he's a Virginia boy. Oh, okay. All right. Next one. Five to three. Cardi, I need some good takes from you if you want to get back in this. Make the case for why Goldberg is the right choice to go against Bobby Lashley at SummerSlam. Make the case. Goldberg is the right guy to challenge Bobby Lashley at SummerSlam. Will, go. Okay, so right now the way we're looking at Bobby Lashley is we're building towards something else. We don't see them long-term putting the belt on Goldberg, but what we're looking for is a recovery match from that terrible heavyweight title at the Royal Rumble this past year. So you're going to give Bobby Lashley a good match, but it gives him kind of that pop for having a champion and a chance to push on to the writing later in the fall between him and a Drew or somebody bigger. He's a placeholder that gives you a shot at a huge match and a huge pop, but we already know who's going to win the match. Okay. Charty, Goldberg is the right person to face Lashley at SummerSlam. Why or why not? Go. I'm going to look at... Oh, I'm going to look at this as a marketing thing. One, easy, you go to spear versus spear. That's like, just just say like there, like these two guys are like two bulls going right at it. Two, every time Goldberg comes out, no matter how much I hit it, he gets a huge pop. He still gets a, he still gets the crowd reaction. Three, his, the ratings always seem to go up. There's a reason why Dodie keeps going back to, to Goldberg. And so the ratings go up whenever you see his name. And four, like, even though he's old, like, that's the main thing. Have him run through a bunch of people this time. Have him run through some people. Spear the living day last out of this guy's and people start to believe this guy can do it. If we can believe that Edge could come back after all these years and still be a title contender, you can do the same thing with Goldberg. Have him come out and just destroy people. Charlie, you barely got that one. I I, I agree that that <laughs> yeah that 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 is. I, I agree. I I hate they go to Goldberg. I get it, but it just and here, here's the biggest reason I don't like it is because as much as the fans pop for him, nobody wants him to win. Yeah. <laughs> so, so by that sheer respect, you're giving Bobby Lashley, Bobby Lashley face attention after what he just did to Kofi. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Everybody wanted Drew to beat him. Nobody wants him to beat Lashley. So I don't want Bobby Lashley to get any love. I want to hate him. So I, I don't understand this decision. I don't get it. Yep. So. So right. do you for you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's, it's called, hey, you know, when in doubt, break glass with a jackhammer. We're, who's our jackhammer? That's Bill Goldberg. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, one day he's gonna. Uh, unfortunately, though, one day when he does his next Bret Hart and puts somebody out of their career, 
then hopefully Vince will stop. But yeah, uh, I, I'm afraid it's going to be too late by then. I'm, I'm really nervous about it. Yeah. Um, all right, two more. Here we go. Charlie, you need both of these to win. Recently, WWE acknowledged the New Day as the best tag team of all time. Tell me why you agree or disagree. WWE tells us New Day is the best tag team of all time. Yes or no? Charlie, go. I disagree because you can think of so many other teams. Like I'm, I'm right away. I'm thinking New Age Outlaws because once, once again, like you know, who gets the crowd going more than New Age Outlaws, or who's more iconic than, let's just say, um, I'm not gonna say the iconic. So uh, Legion of Doom. Like when you think of tag team wrestling, you think of the guys who are coming out with those those spikes. You know, it's in the end, it's all about what comes to your head first. And New Day definitely does not come to my head. Plus, they're a trio too, so that kind of takes away from them. But like you know, it's not like no one says the Freebirds are the best tag team in the world, like of all time, right? That how many titles are the one? I can't even tell you. But in the end they're their marketing dream but at the same time the best tag team in the world i don't think so well is the new day the best tag team in the world why or why not go absolutely not 11 titles do not make you the the greatest of all time look at the young bucks they've got 26 titles they are nowhere near the top of my list you have to be more than a mic and you have to be more than in-ring work and the three of them together are those two things but none of the three are both of those together. Look at Matt and Jeff in their prime. Look at Edge and Christian in their prime. Look at the Hardy Boys. Look at even going deeper, Legion of Doom, the Heart Foundation. All the members could work and all the members could talk. And then you put them in the ring and they were able to develop that way. It wasn't three guys who were funny with one that was really great and two that are just so-so. That's my opinion. <laughs> and Will... I agree with you. You went, you, you get it at six right there. That was a great titles. Do not make the man. They absolutely mm-hmm. do not. I a hundred percent agree with you. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. Um, if that was the case, our truth's the goat. Um, <laughs> for sure. You know, like 50 titles, right? Like, <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. All right, guys, one more, just for the heck of it, just for the heck of it. One more, just for the heck of it, but we got a distinct winner. And I, I will say this. Will, do you agree to these terms? If he just blows your take out of the water, you'll give it to him. Yeah, I can okay. agree to that. I can speak. For, I can yeah. speak for him. Yeah, I can speak okay. for him too. Okay. Yeah, he, he agrees with that. I'm all, I'm always saying that, that. If he came back to me with even a little bit of heck, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, yeah. No, but but all right. Let's say final. Let's take. see what it is. Final take. All right. How about this, Will? I'll let you decide once you hear it. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll go there. Yeah. John Cena is tied with Ric Flair as the only two 16-time World Heavyweight Champions. Make your case for why Cena or someone else should shock the world and break that record. Make your case for why John Cena or somebody else should actually shock the world and break Ric Flair's record. Will, do you want to do this? And if so, you get to pick whether or not you go first. I want to do it. Charlie's going first. Okay, Charlie, make your case for John Cena or somebody else to break the Ric Flair's record. Go. All right, no one's as synonymous with WWE right now other than John Cena. I just have to say it because, like, the man is like the face of WWE, and I think he should break it. And here's why: it's because in this day and age of the like, they're touring every single week. You know, whereas with, with, with Ric Flair, he was doing the territories, going against like a bunch of guys where it's like it wasn't as hectic, as hard. You're not marketing as much. You're not you're not all over Internet. You're not like getting millions of viewers. Even though Ric Flair in his day, you can't you can't fault him for being as good as he was in his day. And the longevity is incredible. But John Cena, like just like the, like, the promo with like marketing T-shirts, I mm-hmm. he has to beat him. Will? 30 seconds. Tell me why John Cena or somebody else needs to break that record. Go. Okay. Simply put, Ric Flair's titles come from the territory days. He was from a different era. He was from a different genre. The style of wrestling was a thousand percent different. Therefore, it the championship reign, like the total championship, t- uh, the, the, the award for most titles, needs to go to a modern day wrestler because the current People who watch wrestling don't appreciate the the territory days. They don't care that Ric Flair held the NWA title 10 times or whatever it was. They don't care that he, you know, toured 300 days out of the year. Like the fact is that that title needs to go to somebody who's currently in the business that can run it. I think I hung myself, but it was going to be close. 
Oof. Charty? What's up? You got halfway there, but we'll still beat you. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I'll give you one more point. Will, you are the ringmaster this week. And guys, to piggyback off your conversation, I do think somebody should break it. Records are meant to be broken. The territory Agreed. age was what it was. Is Ric Flair arguably the greatest of all time? Yes. No argument from me. No argument from most people. He probably will be go down forever as the greatest of all time. My personal go to Shawn Michaels, but that's a whole different story. But I will say this. John Cena is not the guy. Randy Orton's the guy. I can see that. Randy Orton's the guy. You talk about a pure in-ring perspective, as well as in-ring personality, as well as getting anybody over, as well as playing the best uh, baby face in the company and the best heel in the company. Randy Orton is just a once in, not in a generation, he's a once in a era, a once in a business athlete. And I think he needs to be honored for that. And here's how I would book it. If you guys want to change it up, go ahead. I think John Cena goes away after doing all this business he's going to do. Randy gets to 15. Randy gets to 16. At that point, when that happens, John Cena comes calling, but he comes calling as Hollywood Rock. He comes he comes calling finally as a heel. Nobody's getting this but me. Not and especially satellite. not my greatest rival of all time. I can't let you have it. It's going to me. You weren't here. I've been here. I'm the in-ring worker. I'm the guy here every week. I'm busting my butt for the company. You're off making movies. I'm the one who deserves this, not you. Put him at WrestleMania 40, and at the end of it, Randy wins, and they both retire for good. Done. Ooh. Yeah. So I, I like to put in my new uh, nomination for promo of the week to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me you guys don't want to see that. Tell me you don't want to see that. You just sold me on that pay per view, homie. Like, oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, okay. like that, just seeing a heel. Finally, seeing seeing a heel. That would be amazing. But that's then, believable to me. Yeah. That's, yeah. That makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah. Don't just turn I, him heel for the sake of it. That makes sense. I wouldn't gonna. I would go a different route. I mean, not different route, but like I would add on to it. I'd bring back the Legend Killer. You know what I mean? Because that's that's. There's no way, nowhere like you to invoke like emotion by taking out legends. Mm -hmm. So and then, and his the seventeenth win has to be against one of the bit greatest of all time, John Cena. But uh, <laughs> like what, what I'm trying to say, like you know that like. But I love what you said too. Oh my god, that. So would you want be, him to win it as a heel? Man, like. I don't know. I don't know anymore. As long as the the, the moniker of Legend Killer is attached to it, mm -hmm. face or heel, I'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because like I, I could see them doing it face too. Because sometimes the fans just cheer greatness. Yeah. You know, yeah. they just cheer awesome yeah. stuff. Because like you could like you could like sit there and put like Ric Flair in an ambulance, and the fans would be like, "Oh my god, that was so amazing!" You know, like right. like you know what I mean? So it's like heel or face, probably heel, because because it's easier to book a Legend Killer that way. But then, if to go along with you, I could still see Legend Killer face beating an, an uh, heel John Cena mm -hmm. via satellite. You know what I mean? Yeah, I see completely what you're saying. Here's my thing: even when Randy was being the Legend Killer, he still got over. People yeah. still yeah. liked that. Yeah. I, I, it's I don't, and especially at that point in his career versus John Cena, who a lot of fans just let's be honest don't want to see him do it. I think I think a lot more people would be more accepting of Randy winning it than John. I kind I kind of I don't know why I just kind of see that yeah. the, the evolution perspective Rick passing the mantle down to Randy and don't forget before Randy kicked him in the head Rick said I want you to be the guy so yeah. there's a little bit of that mixed in Will what do you think do you want to add anything would you do it a little differently I feel like I would build it up with Randy being a face until the showdown and when the heel turn with Cena happens. That's when you have Randy build as the face. And then right before he cuts a promo, not to say Jericho did it the right way, but like he did this past week on AEW when he brought back the pain maker, mm. I was like, maybe have Randy Orton be a face, but still bring back the moniker. I've got to pull from this person with it within yada, 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 bring back the legend killer. So he's still a face, but he still has that mentality and that drive of yeah. the legend killer without requiring the flip. So awesome. he kind of like, you know, kind of like I said, I don't want to give Chris Jericho credit for a great idea, but that was kind of a great idea to be a face pulling a hill personality and a hill like character back out. I like so it. I kind of feel like that could be the direction they could go with Randy as a yeah. good guy that still pulls his bad boy mentality back. 
Yeah, just and I'm gonna give I'm gonna give uh, Kyle Tyson from Smack Draw all the credit on this. This was his baby idea. He he said that he wants to see the record broken with these two names and it be the last match they both have. And I yeah. think I think I think it's a perfect book ending to a great story. And I, I think it would be I think I would love to see it. I appreciate you guys being on with me this morning. All of you watching, thank you guys for watching this. If you've watched this on YouTube, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And click that bell so that you don't miss a single post every time we put out a video. We greatly appreciate it. Again, if you want to support our show financially, go to patreon.com slash podcast or visit paypal.me slash pod. Also, follow us on our Twitch channels on twitch.tv slash putting you over and our personal Twitch channels, twitch.tv slash podcast. And also, if you're listening Listening to us on a podcast, subscribe to this podcast and make sure you give us a comment and give us a five star rating. I think after an episode like this, we probably deserve it. So make sure that you do that. Your feedback is always appreciated. Thank you for your support. Will, I'm going to throw it over to you right now. Uh, promote yourself. Where can they find you on social media? Where can they find your podcast? What you got going on right now? All right, guys. I am the chef, or I am the Will Gray. Uh, I'm a chef by trade and a mark by choice. Make sure to check me out at Botch Spots and Share Shots on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, go in, like, si- like, subscribe, unsubscribe, whatever you've got to do. It all gets the, the algorithm going and finds new listeners for us. All right, Charlie, put over Getcho, put over yourself. Where can we find you on social media? What do you got going on? I really wanted to win that for the Getcho podcast, boys. I lost 7 4, but it's okay. It wasn't, it wasn't a 10 0. 6 5. 6 5. 6 5. Oh, even better. Even better. 6 5. So. So get your podcast, get your podcast, get your podcast. If you guys want to listen to us, we have, we give you that barbershop feel. It's four guys. We just we don't take wrestling too seriously. Because we what we do at the end of each show, we do a, a sweaty session where we do raps, we do rhymes, we do we do games, anything wrestling related. And then we just we just have that that fun feel. So get your podcast. Uh, find us on Twitter at Get Your Podcast, Instagram. We got all that. My, I'm I'm at Twitter on at Charty Be Bad. And I'm also known as Charlie Do Drop the Bass, but uh, I keep changing my name every other day. But like, it's been an honor being on the show with you guys. You guys have been incredible, and I'd love to do this again someday. So thank you very much. Absolutely, love to have you guys back on. And always, I'm Bama Dave 24. You can find me on social media at Bama Dave 24. You can follow the Bama Slamma podcast at Bama Slamma on Twitter as part of the Smack Draw podcast. You can also find the Smack Draw podcast on Twitter as at Smack Draw pod thank you guys so much and until the next time we drop the hammer thank y'all for joining us on the bama slamma have a good day everybody we'll see you next time mm-hmm.